okay, chat? If your trouble heavy-hearted come to Jesus and find your peace if you're run down empty-handed come to Jesus and find your strength he is hope for the hopeless rest for the weary for the hurting he is he is mending the broken bearing the burdens all that you're needing he is if you're wandering in the darkness come to Jesus and find your and find his grace he is help for the hopeless rest for the weary help for the hurting he is he is mending the broken bearing the burden Counselor, Prince of Peace, author and maker of everything, defender, deliverer, King of Kings, He is, He is, helper and healer forevermore, Savior and shelter through every storm, my refuge, redeemer and Lord of Lords, He is, He is, child of heaven and son of man, provider, protector, the great I am. Omega beginning and end He is, He is Help for the hopeless Rest for the weary Help for the hurting He is, He is Mending the broken Bearing the burdens All that you're needing Good morning, Waterway Church. <laughs> it's, let me try again. Good morning, Waterway Church. Hey, I am glad you're here today. My name is Jesse. I'm one of the pastors. And, and for those of you who are joining us here live, I'm glad that you're here. For those of you who are watching online, uh, blessings to you where you are. Pray that today's service uh, will be a blessing to you, but that you'll also be able to celebrate and, and praise and bless God too. So just a couple quick notes. Number one, you got a, a little handout of a hymn when you walked in and got a bulletin. You don't need it yet. You don't need it yet. So if you didn't get one, you still have time to run to the back. We're going to do that a little bit later in the service. But that's what that is. You can relax about it for now. Second, I just want to remind you, today, like every other week, the songs are picked on purpose. We're not just throwing stuff up against the wall. And so today, look for a theme through the songs that you sing. Think about what you're singing. Think about what you're saying and, and just look for the theme. I think you're going to find one. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to invite you to stand and sing our first song. It's a medley of three different songs. Um, the word Adonai keeps coming up. Adonai is a word for God. It's a name for God that indicates that God is sovereign. He is powerful over all. And so sing along with us. Um, as we're getting ready to start here, say hello to your neighbor and greet them and, and get ready to praise the Lord.
kings of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. Who is like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Mountains bow down and every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai From the rising of the sun To the end of every day Praise Adonai All the nations of the earth All the angels and the saints Sing praise You are mighty You are holy Awesome in your power, you have risen, you have conquered, you beaten the power of death. Alleluia, we will rejoice. We have heard from Jesus, 1 John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from Jesus, 1 John 1, verse 5. God is light, and darkness has no place in Him at all. God is light, and darkness has no place in Him at all. God is light. And darkness has no place in him at all. 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 Amen. Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. And now I'm out of breath and I have to talk, but it's all good. <sighs> good morning, church. It's good to be here. I'm glad to see you here. Uh, this is Waterway Church. Um, we are an evangelical men like congregation. And um, I, what that means, um, I'll try to, try to tell you what it means. Uh, evangelical, um, evan evangelism, um, we're not content with just being... This group, we want to evangelize. We want, we want to tell people about Jesus, to tell the good news that Jesus is the Lord. And so, how are you doing with that? Have you told someone about Jesus lately? I uh, challenge you to do that. Um, evangelical Mennonite. Uh, Mennonite. What's a Mennonite in 2023? Somebody want to tackle that one? <laughs> um, um, yeah, me too. We actually had a, we had a fun, fun conversation at... Um, at our small group this week about, are we Mennonite? What's it mean to be a Mennonite? I didn't know Mennonites voted, uh, stuff like that. But now a little bit what it means for us to be Mennonites here at Waterway um, and some of the long-held beliefs of Mennonites and Anabaptists, the peace and non-resistance. Um, and here we are on Veterans Day weekend, and I actually told a veteran that works for us this morning, happy Veterans Day, and, and thanks for serving. And um, if you think that was hypocritical of me, I'd love to talk to you about that, but I, I think we can do both. Um, another idea, the, the priesthood of believers that we're all kind of, the Holy Spirit talks to all of us, not just our lead pastor Jesse, not the Pope in Rome. Um, we can all be filled with the Spirit and, and led by the Spirit. Um, and so that shows up in, in how we do church. Um, we have, we have um, congregational business meetings, and um, like I said, one person doesn't decide on everything. Um, another belief is that just being separate from the world, um, the verse that talks about being in the world but not of it, um, kind of a long-held Anabaptist and, and uh, Mennonite belief. Um, so that's just a little bit how we, how we live it out here at Waterway. Um, and then we're a congregation. We're, we're together. 
we're not, um, we are, if we're believers, we have a personal relationship with Christ. But we come together, we believe the New Testament preaches that, that we're in this together, that we live life together as brothers and sisters. And so that's why we're here today. That's why we have small groups like I talked about. Um, and if you need any more clarity on any of that, I would love to talk to you. Or um, there's a connection table out in the lobby. Talk to someone out there about small groups, about what does it mean to be an evangelical man like congregation. But anyway, that's a long intro. Thanks for being here. That's who we are a little bit. Um, and so I'm actually going to give away what you're going to talk about, Jesse, because um, I know some of you like to read the back cover of the book before you read the book and, and skip to the back. But so the theme today is, is the resurrection and the life, um, another I am statement from Jesus. When, um, in the story of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus gets sick and ends up dying. And when Jesus comes, part of the conversation, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Um, and so that's the theme today. Um, I want to think about that uh, as we look at the scripture here in Psalm 16, if you want to turn there. Uh, what does it mean to be the resurrection, for Jesus to be the resurrection and the life? What does that mean for us as believers or um, as we're still searching and, and trying to figure out who Jesus is and if we buy what he says? Um, what does it mean for Jesus to be the resurrection and the life? So what's resurrection? Resurrection isn't resurrection just coming back from, from what's dead, coming back to life, um, quite simply. And so we look, uh, as I said, in Psalm 16. So David wrote this psalm, um, and you can kind of see the theme of, of David, and obviously he was before Jesus, so he, he doesn't have the full scripture to lean back on. Um, but as he, as he relates with God, you can kind of see the life that he gets from God, the resurrection life that he's received. And in this, in this psalm, in, in 16, uh, it looks like David's kind of, it seems like he's looking back on a season of, of just good life. Like he, he's counting his blessings almost. Um, and as we know, there's other psalms where, where David's kind of at the opposite spectrum where, like, God, what are you doing? This isn't supposed to be. Um, and so I think in any of those contexts, whether you're in a season of life where it's just, hey, this is good, God, you're good, thank you, or you're trying to figure out what God's doing. Um, I think the key is that Jesus is our resurrection and life, and he can speak life into us in, in any, any of our circumstances. So let's read that. Um, would you stand with me to read Scripture? I, it's been a long time, but I remember these probably mostly old people coming into church and, and having people stand to read the scripture. And I always thought that was a cool idea. And so I guess I'm the old guy telling you to stand now. But um, just in reverence for the word of God, let's look at, at Psalm 16, starting in verse 5. David says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in, pl in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I want to read verse 11 one more time, thinking about this resurrection and the life that David knows and that we can know. You will make known... You make known to me the paths of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Thank you. You may be seated. Melissa, you want to come up? So um, we have Operation Christ Christmas Child. And uh, so what do we have here, Melissa? So, um, Operation Christmas Child is just getting some things for children in other countries that may not have as much as... So we, you have this, have this full box here. It's, where'd you get the box? Did you find it on Amazon or... Right outside in the lobby, actually. Out in the lobby. So there's more boxes out there. If you haven't got a box yet, there are more boxes out. Um, so what kind of stuff do we have in here? 
Um, so there's like, you can get fun toys for the children that would just bring them a delight. And, um, Smells like soap. And <coughs> also like hygiene products like combs and soap and washcloths. Yeah. Yeah, all kinds of good stuff in there. Yeah, and also school supplies like notebook and okay. pencils and crayons. So uh, did you enjoy doing this or was it like, Mom, why do we have to go shopping? No, it's very fun. You enjoyed it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, where, do you know where this is going to end up? Um, in another All country. over the world. Yeah, I'm, is yeah. this, um, can you track these? Is that, the, I think I'm right. Yes. Like, you can go online and track where this yeah, ends up. Yeah, if you keep the other part of your label, you okay. can track it. Yeah. And, yeah. Anything else to say about this? So, uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> Put you on the spot there. I want to keep this up here. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we are doing Operation Christmas Child, many of you know. Um, so next Sunday is the last week to get the boxes in, um, filled up. So if you haven't grabbed a box, get one. We're actually a, a um, drop-off center. So we'll be collecting what we collect, and also churches and individuals from around the area will, will come this week. Um, look in your bulletin for when the drop-off times are, but... Uh, we'll have people here um, staffed and, and collecting these boxes to send off. <clears throat> um, so we'll have a time of prayer for that later on as well. But <clears throat> yeah, grab a box if you haven't already. Um, we do have <clears throat> the offering box in the back as always. Um, we are trying to pay down our debt on our building still. We've um, made great strides, and, and praise God for that. But if you do have year-end giving in mind, uh, keep the, the, the church in mind for the debt so we can pay it down and, and work at other things then. Um, I want to remember uh, Young Life and AABS. Um, they're our mission support partner for this month. Um, we'll be sending out close to 5,000 to each of those groups um, so Young Life works in the schools. Do you know the name of the Young Life director? I should have asked you. Sorry. <laughs> so, my bad, Jesse. Um, we'll pray for it. Young Life goes in the schools, um, has events after school, and, and meets with, with, with kids in high school, um, does Bible studies and, and fun stuff. Um, so that's where half of it's going. The AABS is... Um, African Association of Bible Schools. Uh, if you see in your bulletin, J.C. and Lois Ebersole had that up, J.C. especially. Um, so J.C. will go to countries in Africa, uh, make a couple trips a year <clears throat> to um, just to train pastors in Africa, get them resources um, to study the Bible deeper. Um, you may have heard the good news about... Um, the Coverleys, uh, for Tiff Coverly, uh, great news that, that there is no cancer, so we praise God with her. Um, continue to pray with Donna and her foot as she heals again. Um, and we want to remember Charles and Anne-Marie Smoker. We've supported them for years um, in their work in, in Japan as they, as they spread the gospel there. So I wonder if you'll pray with me. I thought it would be... Um, I thought we could divide up the church with Young Life and ABS. We're sending them money. We don't want to. We don't want it to stop there. Could we spend a minute or two? Um, why don't this half of the congregation, if you could spend a minute praying for Young Life and this half, pray for ABS. If we could come to God um, and remember those two organizations, the leaders. Um, take a minute or two in silence. Pray for those two organizations, and I'll close in prayer.
Lord, we lift up these organizations and the people <clears throat> who are giving their lives to, to furthering your kingdom here in Oxford and, and in the surrounding communities and high schools. We pray for just a sense of, of truth to go out through, through your word and through those people who are interacting. We pray that you would give them your love to pass on to the kids in school. We pray for, for all the work in, in Africa um, with JC and Lois Ebersole and, and all the pastors there. We pray a blessing on their churches this morning as they're meeting. God, we thank you that your word, that your kingdom is, is worldwide and, and will last forever. And so we pray for those brothers and sisters there this morning. We want to pray for Charles and Anne Marie Smoker in Japan. We ask that you would continue to give them life and, and um, vision for that country, for their friends there. Um, give them passion for you and then for others. We think of Bryce, Bryce Angle in, in, in Indonesia. <clears throat> Pray that you would um, help him as he studies the language and culture. Help him to feel connected to you, to make new friends. And to still feel connected back here at home with his family and friends here. Bless him this morning. We praise you with Tiff Coverly and, and the family and for that good news. And we pray for health for, for the rest of the family. And um, as they struggle with health challenges, we pray that you would meet them where they are. That you would lift them up. That they could see your life. We lift up Donna as well. Pray that her heart would be focused on you. Give her attitude, help her attitude to reflect you, even in this time of questioning why. And heal that ankle, Father. God, as we think of you as the resurrection and the life, help us to get our life from you, not from other things around us, not from other people. Help us to look to you for life, for strength. For all we need, may our heart be focused on you. Thank you, Lord, for offering us life. Help us to live it well. Thank you that we can live it together with, with these brothers and sisters. Help us to encourage each other. Help us to go, for, go out from here evangelizing and, and showing the world who you are. Give us courage. Protect us, Father. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us once again in our time of worship and song? The song is called Glorious Day. Living, he loved me. Sing with us. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is he The word became flesh and the light shined among us His glory revealed, living he loved me Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. And that he nations stretched out on a tree. And he took the 
Spirit, I 
have a handout in your, um, your bulletin that you may have received this morning. Um, this song is called The Bread of Life, or I Am the Bread of Life. And this song is a primer to what Jesse will be sharing with us this morning. Comes directly out of the, out of the scriptures that he's going to be sharing. And so Jesse mentioned about intentionality of what we do, what we pick out for songs on a Sunday morning. And, and this song is certainly in the line of that, just just following along in um, what the Lord has for us this morning. So sing this song with us. This might be a new one to some of you, but um, certainly the words ring true with uh, what we're sharing and what we're doing this morning.
Amen. You may be seated. That scripture that Chad talked about comes from John chapter 11, and it says this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary, his sisters, to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. This is the gospel from John, chapter 11, verses 17 to 27, and it frames the rest of what we're doing today. Keep that in mind as you think about all of the things that are happening here in the next little bit. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward. Kids between four years old and first grade, we have children's church today. And so I'd like to, uh, like to invite you guys to come forward before we kind of send you out so that you can learn more about Jesus and what it means to have life in him. My goodness, you guys look like you had a great night last night because you look like you're having a sleepy morning this morning. And you just turned five. I think I heard about that, Everett. How many of you, how many of you woke up this morning but still felt a little sleepy? Did any of you do that? Okay, see, it's not just us. It's them too. All right, well, here's what I'm going to do. Jesus, in the Bible, Jesus told some people, in fact, he told a lot of people, he said, he is the life. And what that means is that even when we feel kind of dead, and there's lots of ways we talk about dead, right? Have you ever heard a grown-up say, oh, I just feel dead today? Have you heard anybody say that? I've heard people say that what they mean is I feel so tired, it's like I'm dead. What well, Jesus says that he can give us life even though we're that way. So I'm going to pray for you guys and for all these grown-ups out here who might be sleepy. I'm going to pray that Jesus helps us all to feel alive. Would you guys pray with me? I like to pray. I usually, you don't have to, but I like to put my hands together like this. I usually bow my head and close my eyes. God, I thank you for these boys and girls. I thank you for the ones that have energy and for the ones that don't. And Lord, I'm thankful for each person in this congregation, for the ones who feel alive and the ones who are just dragging by. Lord God, would you please help us to find life in you today? Help these boys and girls as they go to Children's Church to learn something that will help them to understand who you are and how much you love them and help their teachers to be able to corral all this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. You can go out now. And it looks like Pastor Steve, he doesn't get sleepy. You can go, you can go talk to that guy. It is a joy. That's one of the fun things about having uh, a couple of us pastors working together. Steve and I are on the same mission and we have the same goals, but we do it really differently. Um, it, it's interesting. If any of you were to kind of station yourself here at the office doors at, at say, 8.30 in the morning, you'd see Steve come in and you'd see me come in. And I'll just tell you, it's probably two very different pictures of people arriving at a place. <laughs> Um, that guy just boundless energy. And, and I don't even, it's not even like I can say, well, he's just one of those young guys. With, he just goes. So uh, pray for Pastor Steve this week that that energy keeps working and, and pray for me that I can keep up. Um, so I read, I read a bit for you from John chapter 11 about Jesus speaking to Martha and saying, I am the resurrection and the life. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. But I wanted to tie this in. Um, we, we got a video from one of the mission organizations that we're supporting this month, uh, the Africa Association of Bible Schools. And um, I want to show you this video. It's from their director, J.C. Ebersole. And um, I want you to be thinking, how does resurrection, how does life play into their mission? Because I'm going to ask you that when it's over. Could you guys uh, roll this video for us? The Africa Association of Bible Schools, or AABS, 
exists for the purpose of making biblical education available and affordable in the local churches and communities across Africa and around the world. We provide 62 curricular courses and other items which enable church leaders everywhere to train their leaders and lay people for kingdom work, training that is desperately lacking in many developing countries. To date, we have resourced Bible schools in 22 countries. God is doing many exciting things as our reach is expanding. Just a few examples. National directors have been appointed in eight countries of Southern Africa. In West Africa, five national conferences were held last month. One of our leaders presented the ABS training concept to about 600 pastors in Kenya last month. Two years ago, we began a new branch of AABS, the All Nations Association of Bible Schools. Through it, we are resourcing churches in Mexico, Haiti, Costa Rica, India, and more to come. In November, our new administrative director, Tim Ingold, will travel to Costa Rica to visit the six new Bible schools there and meet other schools. In India, we are communicating with five church networks. Our sincere thank you to all of you who support AABS with your prayers and finances. This could not be done without dedicated partners like you. We need more partners to help us expand to all countries of Africa and around the world. Thank you. So I'm just curious you saw JC talk just a little bit about AABS, what they do, where they're at. Um, there's been a lot of growth there. Why do you think they do what they do? What did you hear in that video that motivates JC and motivates the rest? What did you hear in that video? Why? Why, why does AABS exist? Why do they care? Why bother? Why do we send them money? Why do we pray for them? What did you hear? Some of you are really close. Maybe you have some answers. Come on, interactive time. This is time for you to, to catch your breath and share it with me. What did you hear? Spread the gospel? Why do people care about that, Donna? Anybody have an answer to Donna's statement? Say again? The Great Commission. Jesus, Jesus pushes us forward, says go into all the world, right, and share Share with all the world. So, so there's an obedience to scripture. What else? Did you hear anything else in, in JC's talk and his explanations about what they're doing? Why do they do this? Why bother? Because I'll tell you what, JC could find a job doing more, making more. JC could go to maybe some more exciting places of the world that weren't quite so dangerous or difficult to get to. Hope, what did you hear? They identified a lack of knowledge of God in some areas, and so they take their training out to the world so the Christian brothers and sisters can be lifted up. Good. What else did you hear? What else did you hear as motivation? Why do they bother to do what they do? To equip leaders. To equip leaders? Buzz, why are leaders important? To keep, the going. to keep the mission going. It helps, right? It helps when there's somebody that says, come on, let's go. I'm ready. Let, you know, follow me. Let's do this together. Good. Did you hear anything else? Just curious. It's, it's always interesting to hear what others hear. Hope? Is that, did I hear you right? Okay, it, it, it just, there, there's this hope that God is at work and God is going to continue to be at work. Yeah, I think it's really important. And one of the fun things that I really enjoy observing our mission team doing is thinking about what are these different groups doing? Why are they going out? Why are they sharing all this? And I heard you talking about hope and equipping leaders and making sure people know about Jesus. But do you see how so much of this ties in to all of the gospel, really, but to what Jesus said in John 11, he says, look, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. This is the hope. This is the promise. This is the truth that AABS is excited to share, that we're excited to share, and that really makes this worthwhile. Sometimes people try to boil Jesus down to just this ethical teacher, or, or, or he's this guy who had some really good ideas about how we could get along with each other. And of course, he was a great ethical teacher, and he did have ideas for how we could love each other. But Jesus said over and over and over that he is the son of God and that life only comes through him and apart from him is nothing but just death and pain. But Jesus says, look, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And that motivates AABS and so many other groups that we support to go out and keep doing what they're doing so that more and more people can have this life. See, life begets life, right? You come alive and you don't want to just keep it inside you anymore. Do any of you get excited about anything? 
I, I know one or two of you do. Yeah. Do you ever get to this place where you just have to tell some, have, have any of you ever sat down at the supper table and just been so excited because somebody around you was excited? Let me tell you what happened today. Let me tell you about what I saw. Let me tell you about what I sold, what I did, what I heard, and what I've experienced. Right? This, this message of life and resurrection it excited Jesus to the point that he told Martha and the whole world about it. It excited him to the point that he said, hey, I want all of you to go be disciples and tell the whole world. It motivates AABS. And then I wanted to, I wanted to show you um, something else. I've got a picture here. This is a, a picture from history, and, and I want you to raise your hand if you've seen this image, this picture. It's, this is actually uh, an, an engraving, if I, the original, um, if I remember right. If you've seen this before, would you please raise your hand high? Okay, if you don't have your hand up, don't feel bad. This is kind of a, a classic Mennonite thing. All right, so, so if you're just wondering, like, how did all these people, it's not because you're dumb or that you didn't keep paying attention in high school. It's just that maybe you didn't grow up in the same context as some of us did. All right, so those of you who had your hands up, keep them up real high. I just want to see. It looks like about uh, maybe a third or half of us. All right, now keep your hand up if you know the name of the guy on the left. How many of you know, how many of you paid attention? Oh, okay, Delmar and Elizabeth, I would have expected that. All right, Ryan King, Melanie, well, you heard me talking about the sermon, but maybe you knew that. Anybody over in this half? Kerwin and Maria, all right. Jess, no, you're not, not quite. Anybody? What's the, the guy on the left, the guy in the hat, what's his name? Come on, you had your hands up. Dirk Willems. Dirk Willems. All right, now, church, let me tell you a story. True story. True story. Okay, um, this account is recorded by a guy named Joseph Lichty. It says, uh, late in the winter of 1569, 1569, so we're talking like 450 years ago, Dirk Willems of Holland was discovered as an Anabaptist in the later years of harsh Spanish rule under the Duke of Alva in the Netherlands. In other words, Dirk Willems was an Anabaptist. That's our theology as well. He's a person that, that means that he baptized adults, not just babies. They baptized adults, people who came to faith, and he believed that's how it should be. So in 1569, it was discovered that Dirk Willems, the guy in the hat, the guy who's bending over and reaching, Dirk Willems was an Anabaptist. Now, the Spanish ruled the Netherlands in those days, and the Spanish, of course, were closely aligned with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church only baptized infants at that time, and so there was a rule out that if you were baptizing adults, you were therefore betraying the Catholic Church. You were being, um, you were being uh, just a bad witness of Christ, and in fact, there was a death penalty for those who were discovered as an Anabaptist. Dirk Willems, in 1569, was discovered as an Anabaptist. Here's the rest of the story. After he was discovered, a thief catcher came to arrest him at the village of Asperen. Running for his life, Dirk came to a body of water that was still coated with ice. Now, Dirk had not been eating well lately because he and his other Anabaptist friends were kind of hiding out a bit. They were not favored in the Netherlands. So Dirk came to a body of water still coated with ice. After making his way across the ice in great peril, he realized that the thief catcher pursuing him had fallen through into the freezing water. Turning back, Dirk ran to the struggling man and dragged him safely to shore. That's what this picture is. This is Dirk Willems, who would have been free, who turned around after hearing the cries of his pursuer. He went back and helped him out of the icy water. The thief catcher wanted to release Dirk, but a burgomaster, this is his captain, a burgomaster, having appeared on the scene, reminded the thief catcher that he was under oath to deliver criminals to justice. Dirk was bound off to prison, interrogated and tortured in an unsuccessful effort to make him renounce his faith. He was tried and found guilty of having been rebaptized. What that means is he was baptized as a baby in the Catholic Church like everybody in the territory had been. But then as he read the scriptures later in life, he realized, wait, it looks like Jesus calls me maybe to be baptized again as an adult, one who can make this decision for myself. And so that was his crime. He was tried and found guilty of having been rebaptized, number one, of holding secret meetings in his home, number two, and of allowing baptisms there, all of which he freely confessed. 
He was baptized as an adult. He allowed baptisms in his home, and they had secret meetings. And so, persisting obstinately in his opinion, Dirk was sentenced to execution by fire. We talk today. I've heard people be concerned about religious freedom, and that's a fair discussion. How many of you, when you were baptized, were concerned that someone might haul you off to be burned at the stake? Let's keep everything in perspective, and let's remember that bad things have been happening for a long time, and yet the faith still lives. Nonetheless, there's a little bit more to the story. It's not a great story from a human perspective, but this is what happened. Dirk was sentenced to execution by fire on the day of execution, which was May 16th, 1569. This is recorded in civil annals in the Netherlands, so this isn't just made up stuff. On the day of execution, May 16th, 1569, the fire had been lit and a strong east wind blew the flames away from his upper body after he had been attached to the stake. And so his death was long delayed despite the burning fire at his feet. The strong east wind carried his voice to the next town where people heard him cry more than 70 times, oh my Lord, my God. The judge present was, quote, finally filled with sorrow and regret, unquote. Wheeling his horse around so he saw no more, he ordered the executioner, dispatch this man with a quick death. And so this picture, this etching that we see on our screen today, which was etched by a fellow named Jan Lucan in the late 1600s, this etching shows us a picture of a fellow who was guilty of a deep faith in Christ who went back to help his pursuer, even though he could have been free. He died a terrible death, and many saw it even more heard about it. Let me ask you, what motivates a person to live like that? What can possibly motivate a person? I can understand the running away from the guy who's trying to arrest you because you know there's a death sentence on the other side of it. What motivates a man to turn around and help his pursuer even though in that pursuer's hands is life and death today? What motivates him to go do that? What kind of love and what kind of understanding and what kind of mission do you have to have deep in your gut, in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul to live like that? To know that your life right now is not the most important thing. That that brother needs my help even though he's here to arrest me. In John chapter 11, I read it for you a bit ago. Jesus came to Martha who had just lost her brother. Her brother Lazarus had died a couple days earlier. And she, Martha and Mary, these folks knew Jesus. They were his friends. And Jesus was a bit of a distance away. But they cried out to him. They sent a message to him. Our brother Lazarus is dying, and Jesus could have come right away, but he delayed a bit. There was a method to his style. But he arrived with this brother dead, with these two sisters grieving. Martha speaking to him says, Jesus, I know that if you had been here, he would have lived. Jesus says, your brother can still live. She says, I know. He can live at the end of days when God resurrects everyone. And Jesus said to Martha in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? These are the words of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to submit to you that this is the kind of truth that motivates J.C. Ebersole and AABS and all those other folks associated to go and take this out into the world because they know that this life right here, their comfort and, and all of the stuff that they might like to have is not the most important thing. It is most important that others hear about Jesus and be trained to follow him. And I want to suggest to you that Dirk Willems, who is now, who is now 
captured in art. In fact, if those of you um, who have attended LMH, if you've been there recently, there is still an etching of him on the wall outside the cafeteria. Uh, those of you who may have been there through quizzing, you'll, you'll see this stuff. This isn't just obscure, hidden away in the annals of time kind of things. But Dirk Willems, what would motivate him to go and turn back and to, to save his captor? I want to suggest to you that it was this passage in John 11, which he would have known, which has been a cornerstone for so much Anabaptist and Mennonite thought, and, and even beyond to all of Christendom. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, a lot of people talk about life, right? But how many sources do you have for life even after you die? This is why it's important that Jesus says that he is also the resurrection because there are a lot of things right now that look like they're dead. And frankly, if something's already dead, it doesn't mean much to hear Jesus talking about life unless there's something that can be done about that death. I got an email just the other day from a friend of mine who from time to time, sends out emails to his friends reminding us about the big truths of the kingdom. This friend sent out an email with some facts and history of Veterans Day and said that these facts and history are copied from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs website. I know I'm reading to you a lot today, but I don't want you to think these are my ideas, all right? There are smart people thinking about this stuff. But my friend copied, pasted, and shared this. World War I, known at the time as the Great War, just over 100 years ago, officially ended when the Treaty of Versailles was signed on June 28, 1919, in the Palace of Versailles outside the town of Versailles in France. However, fighting ceased seven months earlier when an armistice or temporary cessation of hostilities between the Allied nations and Germany went into effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. For that reason, November 11th, 1918, is generally regarded as the end of the war to end all wars, which is what World War I was referred to for about 25 years. Veterans Day again from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, Veterans Day continues to be observed on November 11th, regardless of what day of the week on which it falls. The restoration of the observance of Veterans Day to November 11th not only preserves the historical significance of the date, but helps focus attention on the important purpose of Veterans Day, a celebration to honor America's veterans for their patriotism, love of country, and a willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good." Unquote. Now, a couple of things. Was the Great War actually the war that ended all wars? Well, no, because you know, now we call it World War I because we had a World War II. And church, that reminds us that when it's human to human, violence begets violence. War begets war. Rarely, if ever, has war ended all war. Now, regardless of what you think of war and military service, before we go too far down that bunny trail of patriotism and politics, can you imagine, can you imagine why people today sign up to serve in the military when it might cost them their lives, whether you think they should or not? Why do people sign up? Why do people go? Today, there is not a draft like there had been at times in World War I and World War II and in Vietnam and some of those places. Today, we have a military of people who have volunteered to be there. Why do they do that? Well, what I've heard when I've spoken to so many folks who have served as soldiers or people who are thinking about going and, and enlisting to do so is that there is a mission there that matters to them. And if people have a mission that matters, it is amazing the things that they will set aside. I've heard people who wanted to go into the service and they've said that there was something more important to them than even their life. Now, whether you like that statement, whether you agree with the things that those people have said, can you see the importance of a mission that matters? Can you see how having something that is, that is a high priority for you might, might compel you to potentially put your life aside? See, church, we've all got missions in life. You don't have to be a Christian or a soldier to have a mission. Everyone who is living is living for something even if that thing is as small as themselves, even if they don't really know what their mission is. Everyone who is living is living for something. Now, when 
the Apostle John wrote his gospel, he was clear about his mission. He's the one that recorded about Jesus saying that he's the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 20, near the end of his gospel, John wrote this. In John 20, verse 30, he said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In other words, John says, I've written some of this down, but not all of it. There's much more that could be said. Jesus performed many other signs. But these, John 20, verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John said, I am writing this and I am telling you these stories so that you might believe in him and have life in his name. That's his mission. And for John, he was willing to spend his life in prison if he needed to. And at the end, he he was sentenced to. John said, this is the message. And I share it so that you can believe that Jesus is Lord and that by believing you may have life in his name. At other places in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, these bookend John 3, 16, which is so famous. But in John 3, 15, Jesus says that he has come so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And John 3, 17 then says, God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. All who come to me will live even if they die. Another spot, John 3, 36. There's this whole list of just life after life after life. John says, whoever believes in the Son, that is Jesus Christ, has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. There is no other. There's no other way to find any relief from your death. There's no other way to truly live when your body dies. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And in John chapter 5, if you need just one more text to prove it to you, in John chapter 5, we know what Jesus believed because he said, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live. Over and over and over. This is just the Gospel of John. This is just one of many books of the Bible and one of four Gospels that point to the truth of the fact that Jesus stated that he is the Son of God, that in him there is resurrection, there is new life, and in fact there is life everlasting. These verses were foundational for martyrs like Dirk Willems who said, it may cost me my life, but I have to go back and save that man. For Dirk Willems, who says, I am here at the stake and I am burning, but not quickly. And 70 times he cried out enough and the wind carried it to the next town. Oh Lord, my God. What a wonderful, what a wonderful phrase. What a wonderful name to have on your lips, even in a terrible, terrible time. And these verses found all throughout the Gospel of John and found in John 11, Jesus is the resurrection and life. These are foundational for us as a church. How many times have you sung songs? How many times have you read Bible verses and heard scriptures and heard sermons about resurrection and life at least every year at Easter, right? But over and over and over, we are told that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And for those who are kind of familiar with that message, that has a lot of meaning to us. But let me suggest to you that it may not have as much as it could, because I think too many of us think about death too narrowly. Resurrection means bringing something that is dead to life, right? Jesus talks about being the resurrection and the life. But what is this death? When you think of death, what do you think about? What is it that you imagine? Lots of us have lots of different pictures, right? But I think that for most of us, when we think about death, we think about these bodies dying and and moving no more. And some of you can think about death kind of abstractly, intellectually, and you can just sort of sort through it and and describe it. I know doctors and physicians who can describe death as well. It's when there's a lack of oxygen to the brain because of A, B, C, and D. Some of you have very visceral, very emotional responses to the word death, right? Because you've seen it. You've been close to it. You've been affected by it, and it still hurts. But what does death mean really? What is Jesus talking about when he says, I am the resurrection, 
to life. Well, it, it does mean that he can bring dead bodies to life. That doesn't happen very often these days in these parts. But if you keep reading the story in John chapter 11, you will see that Jesus did indeed bring Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. He brought him back to life. We don't know how much longer after that Lazarus lived. It's, it seems to be the case that Lazarus lived out kind of a more normal set of years on this earth. But Jesus brought him back. Some of you, have you ever prayed for someone to be brought back and it hasn't worked? Well, join most of the rest of history. But I think there are lots of kind of deaths that we experience. And I think there are lots of different ways that we see death, feel death, and live death, if we can do so, where we need to find the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, bodies dying, that happens. Yes, people giving their lives to die, martyrdom, that happens. Think about, though, all of the things that you have sacrificed in your life, the things that you once thought would be life but are not part of your life right now. How many of your bodies are dying in a way that you don't like? How many of you have a part of your body that just simply doesn't work anymore? You wish you could control it that way, but you can't. I think about that when I watch athletes these days. I was never a great athlete, but I was better once than I am now. Why can't I jump anymore? Because it doesn't work like that. Why can't I lift that anymore? Why can't I do that anymore? Why am I breathing so heavily? Why am I sweating right now? Because it doesn't work the same way. These bodies are slowly dying, right? Well, is there any life possible if our bodies are slowly dying? Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Well, can I still live some kind of life now even while this body is dying? Can you? I hope in Jesus Christ you can. Otherwise, we might as well just all quit when we're what? About 28. 29-year-olds, I'm sorry. You're on the wrong side of it. It's just going to get worse. I don't care how hard you work. Jesus says, I've come that you may have life. I am the resurrection and the life. What does that mean? Well, we do, our bodies are, are sacrificed. How many of you had a great conversation with one of your brothers just in the back of the church here today? How many of you feel busy? How many of you feel like there is some death in your schedule because you don't have enough capacity to do all the things that you would like to? How many of you feel stretched thin? How many of you woke up this morning and said, I didn't get enough sleep, and I'm not going to get enough sleep tonight, and I'm not going to get enough sleep tomorrow? How many of you are thinking about the stuff that you have to do? Isn't there, isn't there a little bit of death there? Because it's not life. If Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, if Jesus can bring restoration to the areas of our lives that we submit to him, is there any part of our schedules that Jesus can bring back to life if we will follow him? Sometimes we have put to death our achievements, the things that we thought that we would do, the greatness that we thought we would achieve, the money we thought we would make, the position that we thought that we would earn, the power that we thought that we would delegate. We are realizing by this point in our lives that that is not what we are called to or that is not what we are able to achieve anymore. How many of you have that kind of death in your life? Those dreams that have had to die those ambitions that you've had to set aside or that God has called you away from. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Can there be life even if you don't achieve all of what you dreamed about when you were 17 or 19 or 29? Is there life there? Can there be? Oh, there are a lot of ways that we die. We don't think about it as death, but honestly, I heard somebody say this week, I feel like I'm dying from a thousand paper cuts. And I heard another person say, I feel like I'm just being attacked with a thousand little pin pricks. Do you know what that is like? I've heard that from two different people in the last week. It's just interesting. A thousand paper cuts, a thousand pin pricks. How many of you can relate to that? There's nothing big that's wrong. I mean, everything's fine. It seems like God is taking care of stuff. I have enough food. I have, but there's just all these little things that are just dragging me down. Can you relate to that? Can you relate to the feelings of just something's not right? It doesn't feel like life. I don't feel alive. It feels like death. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Is there anything that he can speak into that kind of life when it just seems like there are so many little things that just keep nagging us? Can Jesus rise us above that? Can, can Jesus bring us through that? Can he give us strength? Is there anybody that say, yes, Jesus can do that? Jesus here is speaking to Martha and Mary. Their brother has just died. 
And he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. If their brother has just died and if he can deal with that in a way that brings life, can he deal with your thousand little paper cuts? Can he deal with the death of your dreams and your ambitions? Can he deal with the decay and the sickness of your body? Can Jesus bring us through all that? A whole list of things that we might talk about. Trauma from our past that we can't seem to shake. Big hurts that we're going through right now. Seeing future opportunities or hopes become impossible. Anticipating our own physical death. Losing a loved one to death or addiction or to distance or to anger or to misunderstanding. How many of you have a dead relationship in your life and it's affecting you? Yeah, it affects us. It hurts. It's hard. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, though. Does that have anything to speak into our relationships? Does that have anything to speak into our trauma and our hurts and our opportunities? Does Jesus have anything to say to all that? Yes, he does. But how do we find it? Because so often Jesus delivers in ways that we don't expect. We just want all the paper cuts to be healed. We want the traumas to be erased. We want the future opportunities to be delivered. Jesus doesn't always operate that way. He's got his own way. That's why John tells all these stories. Look how Jesus acts. Look how Jesus delivers. Jesus is indeed the resurrection and the life. What does that mean for us today? Church, I want to tell you just in these last few minutes that it's not as complex as you might assume. How do we find life in Jesus? How do we tap into this resurrection? Well, it's very clear. It's very clear in the words that Jesus said to Martha, Jesus says you need to be saved. He says the one who believes in me will live. That's what it means to be saved, to believe in Jesus, to, to give your assent to him, to say, yes, you are the son of God. And yes, I believe that you have forgiven me of my sins because I've asked you to. I believe that you do love me. Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will live. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus said to Martha, he said, do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe you are Messiah, the son of God who has come into the world. What about you? What about you? This is accessible to everyone. This is available to everyone. Jesus simply says, accept me. And now I'm going to suggest to you some things that you are just going to roll your eyes at because I've said it so many times and I've seen you roll your eyes before some of you. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you that resurrection in Jesus and life in Jesus, once you are saved, and let me tell you, you won't find it if you're not saved because only Jesus can deliver this. But life in Jesus is simply about spending time with Jesus. It's not about going out and doing all the things that you should have done before. It's not strictly about going and changing all the behaviors that you knew you were wrong, but you did anyway. That, that's good stuff. I hope your ethics get better. But I want to suggest to you that praying to Jesus matters more than most of us realize. I want to suggest to you that reading your Bible, even though we read all kinds of stuff, there is something that happens when we open the scripture and we are just simply willing to read about what God has written there. There is something that happens in us that's just bigger than me getting this in my brain so I can remember it and spout it back to you on Sunday. There's something bigger than just, well, I'm going to do my devotions now so I can check it off and be a good Christian. No, there is something that happens in us. God engages us in some way, and I don't know how to understand it because I don't yet understand everything about God. He's too big for me to wrap it up. But there is a life available in Jesus Christ through salvation in him that comes through prayer and simply spending time with him. It's like that person that you love the most in the world. Isn't it fun just to be beside them? Isn't it fun and isn't it a relief when they are finally back from wherever they were? How many of you know the hunger of losing someone and wishing you could just hold them again? What would that do for you? What would that do for your heart? When we have that availability with Jesus, Jesus says, simply come to me. He says, I'm knocking on the door of your heart, just let me in. And there is something that the Spirit does within us when we're willing to do these very simple things of praying, reading the Bible, talking to God and listening to God. Now, not, most of us don't do that because we're just too distracted. We're distracted even by some of the stuff that we 
think is going to be helpful in getting close to God. Lately, as I've been reading, I've been reading one or two books that just have some references that I don't know, and so I've kept my phone beside me, volume off. I've kept my phone beside me because I said, look up stuff as I'm going. What does that mean? What does that word mean? What's that writer referring to in history? And that's just a really handy way to figure out, oh, that's what they're talking about. But that's a mixed blessing because do you know how easy it is once I've gone and just done like a a Wikipedia search or a Google search for that term or that historical event or that thing from the past, do you know how easy it gets into saying, oh, wait, did the Sixers win last night? And there goes 20 minutes. I'm not going to tell you to burn your phones, but I'll bet you don't need them beside you as much as you have them beside you, and I don't need that either. I want to suggest to you, church, that we're talking about big things when we talk about Jesus resurrecting us, bringing us back from the dead and giving us life. We're talking about big things. And yes, there are behaviors that need to change. There are attitudes that need to change. Some of us need therapy and counseling. Some of us need doctors and healing. There are all kinds of things that we might need. But let me tell you that one thing that we all need that has so much more influence than we realize is just simply praying and reading our Bibles and spending time with God in a quiet place, just talking to God like you might talk to me. Oh, God, thank you for today. Oh, God, this is beautiful out here. God, I'm having such a good time. God, I am frustrated with this situation. Can you talk to God that way? There is something that happens in us that I just want to testify about, that that changes me when I talk to him. Do you know why? It's because Jesus has more power at his disposal than we do, because he is the resurrection, and he is the life. If you're not saved, you'll never find it. But once you're saved, it's available to all. If you will pray, if you will read, if you will talk to God, and if you will listen to God. It's not all about doing spiritual backflips or getting some amazing degree in theology or or history or or public speaking or or making sure I can find. Just come to Jesus. Because he says to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread. I am the light. I am the gate. I am the shepherd. Jesus is. Come to him. Just come to him. Spend time with him, praying to God, reading about him in the word. Again, this is almost embarrassing to preach this stuff because it's so basic, right? You've been hearing this for years, but how are you doing with it really? And can you tell me that you've never found any life in any of it when you've really given yourself to it? I've been telling you to pray. How about if we pray? Jesus, we believe that you are the resurrection and the life. Jesus, along with Martha, we say, yes, Lord, we believe. We believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Yes, Jesus, we believe. Church, with heads bowed, are there any of you right now who are, who are for the first time feeling stirred up and, and you're kind of making this statement, even in this prayer that you don't understand? Are there any of you who are saying, yes, I believe in you, Jesus? Again, with, with heads down in a, in a continued posture of prayer, if, if you're kind of for the first time claiming that you believe in Jesus, would you just put your hand up? Any of you here who for the first time are finally discovering this Lord and this Savior? You know, if you're still not sure, keep digging in. Jesus says he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus, we, we, just, we come before you and, and we say, yes, Lord. We believe that you are the Messiah. Now, Jesus, would you please show us what it means that you are the resurrection and the life? Lord, would you take all the little deaths in our life and, and would you bring something through them? Would you show us what you're doing? Would you instill in us this passion for you and this mission for you that allows us to to hold our physical lives lightly because we know what you can bring even through death? Lord God, would you please help us now as we endeavor to get closer to you, to hear from you and find life in you? Lord, we love you. And we pray in your name. Amen. All right. um, Would you stand and with us and sing this closing song this morning? Um, We're we're going to sing uh, Heaven's Gates. Again, it's one more of those songs that that, that has this this theme of life and resurrection. And sing with us and and let me hear some joy. Okay, let me hear some life. Can, Can we sing together? What do you guys have for us?
Folks, whether you understand all of it or not, I hope you will believe the truth that Jesus has opened the gates of heaven. He is the resurrection and the life, and he just keeps calling us in, saying, I've got life for you. No matter what seems to be dying, no matter what seems to be a loss, no matter what seems to be passing away, Jesus says, in me there is life despite all that. And not just life for now, not just for a little while, as long as you can hang on here in this earth, but life forever ever, everlasting life. That's the truth that we're continuing to bring here. At the end of the service today, if you're not sure about that or not clear about that, please come talk to me or talk to one of us or, or Reuben or, or one of the folks who looks like they were just really singing loud because we can tell you more about it. All right, final thing today. Final thing today. Reuben brought the shoe boxes for it and there's a really cool thing happening here in our region over the next half hour. The folks in the greater Philadelphia region who are uh, helping to organize this part of the world, the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. They suggested that all the churches participating pray at noon today for the shoe boxes, the hundreds of thousands of shoe boxes that are going to be going around the world from our area here. And so I wonder, we're a little bit early, but that's okay. We'll pray early, all right? Pray without ceasing anyway, but we're a little early. I wonder if we can pray together for all of these shoe boxes that we're going to be trying to use as tools to show people that there is life in Jesus. Church, would you pray with me as we close? Loving God, we pray for your blessing on the shoe boxes that we're going to be collecting here over the next week or so at Waterway. We pray that you would bless these boxes for the mission that children know more about you. We pray for the hurting children, for their families whose lives will be impacted by these boxes and the contents that we've packed. Lord, we pray especially that through these gifts, the hearts of kids and families will be open to your love and the message of your grace through Jesus Christ. And if they know you already, I pray that they would have one more story about how you are indeed resurrection and life. God, we pray for your grace to be made known around our world, even with people we don't know in places that we've never been. Lord, we pray for children and families who are suffering in the desperate circumstances of poverty, sickness, and war, that you will meet their physical needs. God, we pray for your bounty. We pray that these shoeboxes will be useful tools to open doors for the proclamation of the gospel. And Lord, we pray also for those who are participating in some way in the mission of Operation Christmas Child. And we pray for the process of collecting and processing and transporting and delivering all of it. Lord, let your hand be on it so that everything gets exactly where it needs to go. Lord God, we pray that you would open the way for these shoeboxes to be delivered to people who need to know of your love for them. To this end, we ask for your blessing. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Folks, thanks for being with us here at Waterway Church today as we've tried to figure out a little bit more what it means that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Go take that life now with you as you get back out into your life. Take life to life, all right? Amen. We'll see you next time.